Life as a parent is nonstop. I'm so focused on keeping my family healthy that I barely have time to take care of myself. If this sounds like you, then you need to give Symbiotica a try. Symbiotica is a health and wellness company that empowers individuals to take ownership of their health with high-quality formulas and supplements crafted to boost energy, immunity, gut health, and more. Symbiotica supplements are made with clean, natural ingredients, and they don't contain any toxins or artificial ingredients. Because they were designed for us, busy parents. They're quick and easy to take. Just a daily dose for your energy, immune system, and overall well-being. It's made staying consistent so much easier. And the best part? Symbiotica is having their holiday sale, so now's the perfect time to put your health in the driver's seat. Head to Symbiotica.com for 20% off with code GIFT20. That's C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com with code GIFT20 for 20% off. Your health transformation journey starts now. Symbiotica Natural and Organic Supplements. You've discovered your link to GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat podcast. Now, here's your host, GoPowerCat.com publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to another edition of the PowerCat Questions podcast, your holiday edition. How's that? Ho, 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 and a Merry Christmas to all. Of course, this is releasing on Christmas Eve, so that's a little premature, unless you're one of those weirdos that opens your presents on Christmas Eve. Oh, I don't know about people like that. I'm Tim Fitzgerald, and I was raised to open my presents on Christmas morning right after Santa arrives. And that's the American way. Along with Zach Carlson and Ryan Gilbert, who were both naughty boys all through 2020 and will get no presents at all. Oh. But you're getting a present of a podcast right here from the Go Power Cat staff. Your questions from Wabash Station, and of course, we're brought to you by Fridge, the place with the greatest presents of all. The kind of presents that you receive, and then after you open them, you don't remember getting them. The Fridge, at the corner of this and that in the town in which we live. And they course, no longer have a yeah. no longer have a blockbuster sign. What what the Sam Hill 2020 just went off the cliff. Uh, folks, if you don't know that uh, the fridge is in the old Blockbuster building, uh, Gills, you know what a Blockbuster is? I do, I do. Okay, good, good. I'm just trying to keep up with the, the <laughs> challenges of having a much more youthful member of this cast. Um, it, so they just replaced uh, their sign. Their sign for years was just the Blockbuster sign with a fridge insert in it. But now they have a just a regular old sign on a big stick. And I'm not happy because now I don't think they'll honor my Blockbuster card at all. And it really ruins the Die Hard on VHS joke. Yeah, I feel like an era has died with that sign coming down. Man. Yeah. I'm just, I, I don't even know what to say. It's a fine sign. There's nothing wrong with the sign, but there's nothing right with the new sign either because the old one was right. That's all I got to say about that. But they're still our sponsor for now. So I get rid of them because of the sign. Uh, our segment sponsors are Tanner's and the High Lows. Stop on by. The High Lows all decked out for Christmas. And Tanner's, no matter when you go in, it feels like it's filled with holiday cheer. Okay, guys, it, it sounds like people really didn't know what to ask us this this time around. Like. The football team shut down. Recruiting came and went. The basketball team is meh. Well, I, just, I, I wouldn't know what to ask. I don't, I don't know. We'll do our best to answer your questions. That's what we do here. We're like doctors. I mean, surgically, we like to be in ideal settings, which in this case would be great questions. But if we have to be field surgeons and go out in the field and, you know, slice you open and fix you, We'll do it. That's this podcast. Here we go. Gills, take it away. First question of the podcast is from Herdez Joe. This team is finally showing some fight in the ability to grow. Will they be a factor in the middle of the league? No. no I don't think so. Um, they just, they're boys. They're young guys. They're not big enough, strong enough to compete with these teams. I look what Kansas did to West Virginia on, what was it, Tuesday, that's a perfect sign. I mean, West Virginia is a legitimate top-ten team. 
And that's going to be kind of close to the middle of this conference. That's how good the conference is. I mean, I think both Baylor and Kansas are final four material. Texas Tech's in that mix. Uh, who am I forgetting here? I'm forgetting someone else. Texas. Here. Texas is good, except for their coach's new haircut. Oh. <laughs> oh. Go back to shaving your head, Shaka. Shaka and Frank Martin have got things all screwed up. Frank apparently lost hair from COVID, which is weird. So he just shaved his head. Uh, he now looks like um, a serial killer. Not that he always <laughs> didn't look like a serial killer when he gave you those eyes. Is typically a person who murders three or four. Usually, it's because of abnormal psychological gratification. The murders taking place for more than a month, and including a significant period of time between them. Would you like to hear more? No, I'm I'm good, Siri. Thank you. I appreciate you hopping into the podcast all volunteer like. That was cool. Wow. Is, is Siri a serial killer? Siri, are you a serial killer? Oh, she's not going to answer. Oh, boy. Sorry. Oh, no. She she wanted to participate. Now she doesn't now. I don't even understand how she – she was asleep. She woke up yeah. to share that information. She sure did. Ah, scary. Uh, and Shaka looks like – I don't even know what Shaka looks like. He looks like a poorly drawn cartoon character. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the league's really good. And – um, it's as good as it has been, and it's always been pretty strong, but the middle of it's really tough. And I, I think it's going to get very interesting for K-State. I think this team will improve. We're seeing them improve. I think this team has a really good upside. But if you're saying the middle of the conference, you're talking fifth or sixth place, you know, and uh, fourth, fifth, sixth, I don't see it. Seventh, I mean, I just don't see it. I think competing with Iowa State and TCU, the other teams picked alongside them at the bottom of the league, um, you know, go go beat them. Sweep those series, and that, then I'll be really happy. Maybe steal one or two others. But let's, let's stay realistic about this season. And if we get better than that, I'll be gladly, you know, I'll gladly be wrong on this one. I absolutely will. But um, physically, the difference right now for K-State is going to be really tough to overcome. But I think we're all beginning to see the upside could be really good for this group. I'm excited about the future of K-State basketball. I can see it. I can see what these guys will will become. And, uh, you know, it's, we're just beginning the process. But don't get carried away. Let's handle Omaha after the holiday here. They're Mavericks. They could come in here and upset K-State. We'll see what happens. When they get back in the conference play, it'll be interesting. But, boy, they're going to take some lumps along the way. And I hope they learn to fight like Wildcats. Because we are the Kansas State Wildcats because Coach Charlie Bachman, many, many years ago, who came to K-State from Northwestern, said, my guys fight like Wildcats. And then it was no longer the Yaggies and they became the Wildcats. Or were they the Farmers at that point? I don't know. That's how they became the Wildcats, and it's kind of ingrained. Let's see if they can fight. Boy, that was a long answer. Anyone else? Yeah. yeah. Uh, like you said, Fitz, the top four and really even five teams in this league, they are in a different stratosphere than K-State is in. So let's take those other five teams, OU, Oklahoma State, Iowa State, TCU, K-State. You know, those, that, that is the league that K-State's competing in this year. And if K-State can finish in the middle of that, which would be eighth. I mean, I would see that as a win. I mean, the team was picked 10th by the coaches in the conference, which I don't think is a stretch. And I don't think that that was any disrespect to K state by any means. I mean, it's, I think it was realistic, but you know, they, they showed some good, uh, you know, some good promise against Iowa state. I mean, Baylor was a buzzsaw. I mean, that was going to happen. I mean, I, losing by 31 points, is unsurprising to me. Um, disappointed they gave up 100 points, but it's Baylor. Sure, they were off for a few weeks, but or a few days, you know, whatever it was for COVID. But you know, I, K State was never going to win that game. And then against Jacksonville on Monday, they looked really good. They shot the ball. They shot the ball really well. 
So, yeah, you can kind of chalk that up to Milwaukee being a lesser opponent, being Milwaukee, but you got to shoot the ball well if you're going to win. And I think that was a good kind of confidence boost for K-State. We'll see if the off week, you know, slows them down at all going into Omaha. But, you know, if they can use that as a stepping stone for Omaha, I think that they're in a much better position going forward into conference play than what we felt like after the Fort Hayes State game. Gills, did you catch how he switched opponents on us right there? He got all of his towns yeah. confused. <clears throat> I, I did. I Started, didn't want to say anything, but. I, oh, yeah. You know, it's good. Uh, did I? What did it's, I? It's manners not to correct your sidekicks, but you went from talking about Jacksonville to all of a sudden you're talking about Milwaukee. <laughs> I, I'm worried about. Oh my that. gosh! Oh yeah, that was bad. Uh, that was bad. My bad. Have we, Milwaukee was the one loss. Jacksonville was Monday. Yes. No, correct Milwaukee. Me. Yeah, well, they beat Milwaukee too. Have, have I we, know. Yeah. Have we? Uh, have we stopped to consider that they have wins over Kansas City, Milwaukee, and Jacksonville, and and Ames? I don't know if I would say it's ever been called Ames, but I think to fit the joke there, they could be Ames. <laughs> well, good news. They play Omaha. Next week. So there's another named after the city in which we play team. Okay, Gills, back to you, suburban. Next question from Yo Mama. Please discuss the importance and role of upperclassmen in a D1 basketball locker room. You know, it's interesting. Folks, if you haven't listened to the Insiders podcast this week, I know you probably – that look, the downloads aren't very good because it's about basketball. I get it. But this is really – Interesting because two more former K State basketball players are on with Matt Walters and myself, Josh Reed and Aaron Schwartz and Druber. And one of the things they talk about when they were young, they had a bunch of veteran guys that they played pickup games with, or they went to practice and saw them immediately, and they thought they were really good. And then they, they you know, they find out it was a whole different game. This is one of my concerns with this team. They have Mike McGurl. They have one legitimate, experienced upperclassman. I mean, the other three were still trying to figure out how to get by as freshmen last year. It's not like they're grizzled veterans of Big 12 play, the three sophomores. They they don't really have that core group of upperclassmen to show them ropes and beat them up in practice and let them know how tough they're going to be, they need to be. They're going to have to find this out for themselves. And, and lacking a, a group larger than one uh, is less than ideal because they're going to have to learn their lessons on TV in front of the eyes of their fans. And it's going to be difficult to watch. And we saw it against Baylor. It was, it was tough to watch. But it, it wasn't like K-State was playing horrendously. They just were completely outmatched. It was like playing with your big brother on the driveway before you were ready to win the games. He would just take the ball away from you, block your shot, post you up, whatever they you know a bigger, stronger opponent can do. They're going to go through that all year, and they're not going to get to experience that as much in practice. They're just playing against themselves, and they're going to have to figure out this is how we need to play in games by playing in the games. I think if you look back at last year even when you know you lose Dean, you lose Barry, you lose Cam, and then Xavier Sneed is your leader. And not that he's a bad leader, but he's not you know the caliber of those guys that that left him uh, left before. And then you lose him after this year and you just have Mike. So it's just, we've kind of had this progression of, you know, guys, I don't want to call Mike a bad leader, but he's not the type of guy that, you know, for his role and what it should be on the floor, that's not who you should be counting on to be your, your leader. So I feel like the last couple of years, you know, there's been that lacking, you know, upper influence and it's just you know it's been that attrition of just not having guys and having guys transfer out and just leaving um and and i think that what this class and you know these last two classes these freshmen and sophomores somebody's gonna have to emerge and become the berry you know become the guy that is like i am gonna own everything you know win or lose with this team this is my team you know we're gonna win games, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to play hard, you know, we're going to take ownership. And I, we, I don't think we've seen that yet. Um, it would be nice to have an upperclassman there, but when Mike's your upperclassman, you know, I, he, how much, how much, how willing is Mike right now to, to be the guy that says, I'm going to, you know, own this. 
because, you know, he's going to be gone, you know, in a few months, you know, it's got to be somebody like Nigel Pack or Dejuan Gordon or somebody, you know, maybe not necessarily a vocal leader, but somebody needs to step up and say, Hey, I am the guy let's go after it. So, and then, you know, we'll see that in a couple of years where they're the upperclassman leader and it just, each class that comes in, they need to find a guy that can kind of take over that role. Gills, let me ask you this. Are we seeing Dejuan Gordon kind of do that? I'm going to go do the dirty work. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get rebounds. I'm going to play defense. This is what you got to do to win games. I would hope so. But, uh, I mean, just hearing him talk, and I don't think he's much of a vocal leader in practice either, so I don't know how much he he does vocally. But, you know, more of a lead-by-example type player would be – more appropriate for Dejuan, but I, I certainly would hope that he can kind of get into that role for, you know, next season and then his senior season to have those young guys kind of look up to him. Um, but, you know, to answer the question, uh, it goes without saying that it's in, certainly is really important um, to have those upperclassmen, but I think it, you know, a lot of it depends on how they handle that role. You know, Mike's doing the best he can, but like you said, Zach, he's not naturally a leader. He's a role player. Um, you know, look at Cartier last year. I don't think that he was the best, you know, leader for his young guys. So I think the um, personality and the work ethic and all that, you know, the hours in the gym, I think that's a lot more important than just simply, you know, being in an upper class. And you've got to show those young guys, you know, what it's like to play, um, you know, at, 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 you know, at the D1 level. Agreed. Next question from Dr. J54. Follow up on the ESPN broadcaster question from last week. Granted that having a home announcer uh, announcer team would be unfair, why not announcers from somewhere else in the same league? Our guys could call the same, uh, could call games that K-State wasn't in. Some other set of announcers from around the Big 12 could call our games. Wouldn't that be better than people who don't know the league at all? Well, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean... When you look at the ESPN Plus announcers, they're, you know, K State's paying them. You know, they're part of the package. It's Brian Smoller, who's on the payroll, and quite often Stan Weber hops over there um, to do those games. I don't see those guys ever wanting to go do the Baylor Texas Tech game and go there. I mean, you know, I mean, it doesn't yeah. make sense. Um, I mean, if ESPN is going to use remote announcers, they probably just need to have a group of announcers who do a lot of Big 12 games and, you know, will learn to to do those games. I, I don't know. I We're entering a whole new phase here in college sports coverage. I think that the networks are going to get very comfortable with remote announcing. And it's not ideal. It's just not. You know, I'm seeing the NBA guys do it now, and there's a lag, and it's just I don't I don't see how this is going to ever work the right way. But um, we'll see how it all plays out. We'll see if they figure it out better. If they, you know, if they go in and lay fiber for every announcer, maybe that works. But uh, I don't know. I'm no, I don't. I don't see that happening. Just bluntly put, I don't see it happening. No, I don't even think it's that unfair. You know, when you listen to Ben Boyle and Stan Weber on the ESPN Plus call, it's not like they're complete K-State homers on well, the broadcast. Uh, let me just say this, though, Zach. That's true of K-State. That's kind of a K-State yeah. tradition. There's no we or us on their you know broadcast. Stan and Wyatt, when they call radio, are very careful to, yeah, they're K-State. And yeah, they see things from K-State's angle, but they're not raw rawing like we hear from other schools. I mean, how a, a K-State radio broadcast is handled is much different than a, a Kansas radio broadcast in which their fans want we and us and that kind of stuff. K-Staters have I've kind of grown accustomed to more of a professional approach to it, while other schools want the Homer approach. And it's it's hard to handle someone else's Homer. It's good if it's your Homer, but someone else's, man, that's tough. You know, if you can find guys, you know, in each school that are, you know, impartial announcers or, you know, someone like, like I mentioned, like Ben, Ben Boyle, you know, just, you know, call the game. But when it comes down to it with, with ESPN, you know, there's only five games in a given window per week, 
you know, your early window, your midweek window, and then your Saturday window. So you only really need five announced teams. And, you know, I know that there were complaints about the guys at Iowa state, but you know, one of the guys, the, the color guy was a former Baylor player. I mean, yeah, he, he wasn't that great, and he was kind of painful to listen to at <laughs> he's times. He's a goofball. He's gone but, backwards. He's gotten worse. I don't understand. <laughs> yep. But you know, he like he mentioned. He you know he mentioned playing with Barry, playing against Barry Brown. You know, th- those types of guys. You know, whether you like them or not, you know they're inexperienced. But at the very least, they have insight into the yeah. league, and that's. You know, I can overlook, you know, being a lesser announcer if you provide some sort of insight into what, you know, they're calling. So, you know, from that standpoint, I can appreciate it. Um, I don't know if they were, were they remote for that game or, I think or were so. they, were they there? I think they were remote. That'd be my okay. guess. Yeah. I mean. And it makes it difficult. Yeah. It makes it difficult. And, you know, you can chalk some of that up to it, but. You know, there's there's probably going to – you can probably count on one hand the number of different announced teams that will call K-State games in the Big 12, at least – at the very least on ESPN+. Plus. There's not going to be that different of of who's calling the games. I mean, think about Fran Fraschilla. You know, he's a Big 12 guy, so to speak, for ESPN. He – you know, he's, he's the Big 12's Bill Walton. You know, I mean, he's not crazy like Bill Walton, but, you know, he stays he stays within his region. You know, he stays in his market where where he knows and and what's going on. So, um, you know, if you can find more of those types of guys, I mean, not everybody's going to be smart as Fran and famous as Fran. But, you know, as long as you can call the game and do your research, you know, you shouldn't have that much of a problem. And a lot of it's just these guys are going to need experience, you know, if they're new, if they're sitting there in the arena or not. It just comes down to experience, I think. King McClure, that's his name, isn't it? King McClure. What a great name, though. Anyway, he's got a great voice, and he does know basketball. He just seemed disjointed and out of sync through that whole game. And um, I think it was him being inexperienced and remote put together. It just, I thought he was okay last year. Not great, but you know, I'm willing to tolerate someone's learning curve, but man, he was not good in that game. To answer the question. I mean, I don't, I don't, I think what ESPN is doing is fine. Obviously the remote stuff is just terrible, but you know, like Rich Hollenberg and um, you know, Bob Oshusen's always kind of got the prime time slot. Um, whether it's the early week or the Saturday, and then they've got Chucky Kemp, you know, those guys are always in the big 12. So, you know, I don't, they never really have a problem with player names or anything like that. Obviously they kind of use the same notes and stuff like, you know, how many times were we, you know, how, how many miles was it that Dean Wade had to travel to get to, you know, his nearest McDonald's. I feel like every game they mentioned that one. So, you know, they kind of use the same stuff, but they're, I think they're familiar enough. And I don't think that this home away announcer thing, whatever the question was, uh, I think ESPN's doing a, a good enough job. I'm good with Chucky. I like Chucky a lot. I mean, he's a young guy. He's, yeah. he's not long out of college. Went to Northwest Missouri State. Um, still, I think, lives in Maryville, Missouri. I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I think he's really good. Uh, so I would love it if they found more guys like that and quit digging up um, – you know, some of the guys that are being recycled over and over. I'm now thinking of a couple of football announcers. But um, that's why I'm fine with King McClure. Let's find some young guys. I mean, he wasn't good. But uh, like I said, if it's on your learning curve, I can put up with it. If it's an older guy, I have no tolerance for Bill Walton. When he settles in and talks basketball, great. Dick Vitale, when he's talking basketball, great. I'm watching a game. What, what game was it? He was remote. Um, and all of a sudden he's talking about Mick Jagger moved in next door to him or down the street. And he's got to go to dinner, lunch with him. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? There's basketball taking place. And that's what bothers me. Be better for baseball. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, it's a base, that's a baseball conversation. It's not a basketball conversation when there's action in front of you. Mm-hmm. That's just the whole thing's weird. It's, it's just the color. Yeah. They're supposed it, to add in something that you didn't know about the game. Right. Exactly. And it just almost strikes me like it's a confession to their own boredom when they go off topic like that. When all of a sudden in the middle of the game, they're talking about Mick Jagger moved in 
down the road from them. It's like, well, first of all, I think you're just humble bragging here. Uh, second of all, uh, I have no idea why we need to know this right now. That's great for a podcast or a radio hit. Why are you telling me that in the middle of the game you're supposed to be covering? Next question from Dr. J54. The near total absence of fans brings one benefit. We can now learn what, what uh, exactly what Bruce yells at his players while the game is going on. Please tell us the specifics in depth. Doesn't the other team hear it also, and doesn't that cancel out the benefit of it? Uh, Bills, you're the only one here that's been to a game this year. Yeah. What's what's he yelling? Barry. <laughs> <laughs> He's not yelling Barry, but you can't understand him half the time. There, yeah, was a, yeah. there was a great moment in the uh, Jacksonville game where K-State was at the other end of the floor. I think they were getting ready. Someone was getting ready to shoot a free throw, and he yelled at Dejuan, and Dejuan looked at him and literally gave him that look that with your face that says, what the hell are you talking about? He couldn't understand what he was. He just he put up his hands like, I don't understand the language you speak, and turned around and just ignored him. He couldn't figure out what his coach was yelling at him. It was strange. It was so funny. It was a Bruce moment. You know, what are you doing? What What are you trying to communicate? Because you're not getting it done. I wish I could the- give specifics, um, but I, I haven't heard, you know, a curse word. or I, I don't know. I have, I have no funny story to tell, but – it was it was last game actually against Jacksonville. Zach, not at Milwaukee. Yeah, my bad, my bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> Doug Sermons went up to Antonio and just told him to basically like, shut the hell up because he was chirping at the other team. So <laughs> that was entertaining. But other than that, I've got nothing really that that I can that can speak on. Yeah, I don't think it's a big deal if the other team knows what you're yelling because even you know if there's fans there. They know what you're yelling or you're not paying attention to it because usually it's instructions on positioning like, hey, go, (laughs) you know, you need to be in this position, like go, go guard this guy. And then the other team is going to be like, yeah, of course. Yeah, you should guard our guy. He's good. I don't I don't know. There's I don't think it's as as big of a deal as what it might seem. It's just we do notice it on TV. You can hear him. You can hear all coaches. And you really can't, like the question was, you really can't hear what they're saying, but you can hear their voices. It's really, really odd. Last question of the first half is from third gen wildcat. Um, Not sure if we've ever seen you ask a question on here before. So welcome to the podcast. Um, He says, I know non-major sports, football and basketball have taken the biggest hit around the country this year. Have we, have we heard, of any K-State's programs being in danger, how has the athletic department weathered this storm? I guess meaning excluding football and basketball there. Uh, well, I mean, if it's like, if you mean sports being dropped, K-State's at the minimum, they can't. They want to stay in the NCAA yeah. Division One. They have to continue to offer these sports. There might be one over on the women's side. I'm not sure, but nope, they're they're 16. Yeah, they they can't drop anything. They just can't. What we're seeing is a retraction from these universities that have had long standing traditions of sponsoring swimming or wrestling or you know even track and field at some places. Baseball, they're, baseball, um, and they're saying we're. The cost of these is too much. We've got to retract. I'm surprised we haven't seen more just say, you know what, we're going to the minimum. K-State's doing it right. I'm sorry. They really are. And it's paid off really well in this time period. Um, uh, And I I get if you are a, a Texas, you can afford to have swimming and all those other sports. Do I wish K State had men's wrestling, women's softball, things like that? Yeah, of course I do, but they don't. They just, it's not going to happen. This pandemic has made that very clear. You've got to afford yourselves an opportunity when times are bad to keep your head above water. And that's what K-State's been able to do. Yeah, the fact that K-State's been at the minimum, I mean, that helps them tremendously. We don't have to talk about them cutting a sport because they're already, you know, playing as as little as they can. Um, and, And I think that, you know, it started with John Curry and it's continued under Gene Taylor. They've ran a profitable budget year after year. You know, they, they balance their budget very well. 
And, you know, that's why the athletic department isn't in as bad of a position as some of the rest of the athletic departments are across the country. You know, I'm pretty sure that, um, you know, there's some people in the athletic department that have to take some furlough days. I think it might be something like 10 days, you know, essentially two weeks of work, you know, between now and then and the end of the budget year, whenever that they just have to take off. But, you know, aside from that, it's really not terrible. You know, the, the athletic department has been able to somewhat survive this last year. Now it remains to be seen how much TV revenue they get, you know, going into next year, how much NCAA tournament revenue they get, um, you know, what, what that conference revenue is, you know, uh, plus they didn't have ticket, you know, they didn't sell tickets really for football or basketball. That's a, not a major source. I mean, it is a major source of income, but it's not, you know, the biggest one. So, you know, if there's no fans in seats next year, that's going to be concerning. If they're still only playing conference games next season, that's going to be concerning. You know, if, if September, whatever, you know, the first Saturday in September or last Saturday of August, whatever it's going to be next year, if there's no fans or limited fans in attendance at K-State, I'd be concerned. I would be concerned. But right now, I think you have to feel pretty good about how everything's been managed so far during the pandemic. Well said. We don't usually tolerate well said on this podcast, but good job. That's it for the first half of the Powercat Questions podcast. As we head you into the Christmas celebrations. And when you think of the Power Cat Podcast, you think, that's the gift that keeps on giving. And we're going to give some more right after this break. The Power Cat Podcast will be right back. Getting the crew together isn't as easy as it used to be. We get it. Life comes at you fast. But trust us, your pals are desperate for a good hang. And when they hear you stock the party with drinks from Drizzly they'll be banging down your door. Let Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery, take care of the supplies. All you need is an excuse. It doesn't even have to be a good one. It's your dog's birthday. The loquats are finally ripe. Whatever. With Drizzly, you can compare prices on a massive selection of beer, wine, and spirits and get them delivered straight to your door, which means you can entice the crew to leave their houses without ever leaving yours. Whatever the occasion, download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. JamesAllen.com is the online destination to easily design a customized engagement ring and save up to 50% compared to traditional stores. You pick a diamond, whether it's lab created or earth created. James Allen has over 200,000 conflict free stones. Then you pick your ring setting and metal. And if you need some help, they have real time diamond consultations available where an expert can walk you through it all. Get 25% off your order at jamesallen.com code podcast. That's jamesallen.com code podcast. We now send it back to the PowerCat podcast. Welcome back to the PowerCat questions podcast sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Segment sponsors are Tanners and the High Low. Make sure you support all those local businesses and support local businesses in your town, any town, every town you go to. It's rough times out there. It's rough times out there. And I'd like to say hi to the overlords in China that are currently listening to us. I found out this week that China listens in on Zoom. I love it. And if you say bad things about their government, they will shut you down within a minute. So we're not going to do that because we need this. Like I need the cheap socks that I just bought from China. Thanks. And if they do shut us down, we can move over to TikTok and do a TikTok live. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Is that like a podcast and we got to dance during it? Uh, sure. Okay. We can use your ring. We can set up your ring lights. I like it. I yeah. Like it a lot. Uh, Zach, I, I got something to tell you. So, uh, folks, Zach sent me a really great TikTok of a guy eating Whataburger for the first time. And it was, it was really, it was, it was a funny video. It was cool. Uh, he was kind of gross because he had this scraggly beard and it was getting in his patty melt. It just grossed me out. But anyhow, that's not at all what I'm trying to say here. Zach, I downloaded TikTok. <clears throat> My man. Boy. 
you are never going to watch Netflix, Amazon, <laughs> Amazon Prime, Hulu, HBO Max. You are never watching those again. You are going to be living on TikTok 24-7 like me. Mm, mm, yep. Mm. I'm excited. I think after the holiday break, everyone's going to notice that I'm uh, much cooler than I was before TikTok. Now I'll have TikTok and I'll be very hip and some great dance moves. Great, great dance moves. Speaking of dance moves, this is the Parquet Questions podcast. I don't know what that has to do with dance, but I just tied it together there. <laughs> Terrible segue. That's what you do when you're a podcasting <laughs> professional. It's your questions from Wabash Station. Here's Gills. First question of the second half is from Jay Boland, PSU. Jay Boland. Skyler coming back is a little bit of a surprise. I love Skyler, and I'm glad he's back. But is Skyler coming back a risk of possibly losing Howard or Rubley to the transfer portal? No. No. I don't Not this think, year. I don't think he would come back if, if that was really a threat. Rubley doesn't care. Rubley's all in on the competition. Um, Howard wasn't ready to play. I mean, he was, but then when he... When the lessons got a little bit steeper, he, he wasn't quite up to the task. So this is really kind of essential for K-State football. I mean, we would be looking at going through a lot of the same things again next year. So um, having him available in the quarterback room and kind of to tutor those guys is really good for the long-term forecast of this program. I'm, I'm excited to have Skyler back. It's, it's good in every sense, and I don't think it's going to impact these guys. What will cause a transfer is if one of the two young guys proves to be significantly better than the other guy, and it's really not a, a competition at all. And the other guy might say, okay, I better go somewhere else. I'm not going to play here because this guy is in the same class now. They'll both be freshmen next year. Yeah, I don't think that Skyler coming back affects the decision between Howard or Rubley transferring. I think that that's completely independent. I'm not saying that they can't, that one of them won't transfer because I think it's probably greater than 50% chance that one of them does in a couple of years. I think one, one will emerge as the guy, you know, going forward and barring, you know, an injury early on to one of them, the other one's not going to have really an opportunity to showcase themselves unless this offense just, becomes magically creative, does some weird wildcat stuff. I, I don't know, but Skyler coming back is, is good for the quarterback position. Like, cause like you said, Will Howard was completely unprepared at times this year. And that's not to fault Will Howard. He just didn't have the time to be prepared. He's a true freshman. He's 18 years old. You know, that's <laughs> what, what you got in this pandemic season as a true freshman, you know, you kind of got to, you know, just take it for what it was. Um, but Skyler coming back, he can mentor both of them, you know, but he's going to be good for this offense. This offense, you know, even outside, you know, just take away the quarterback, you know, take away Will Howard this year. This offense really didn't have anything other than Deuce Vaughn for most of the, the season. Bradley Moore for the early half. He's gone too. So I think that Skyler coming back gives kind of a calming reassurance to what this offense will be next year. And depending on who else comes back, wide receivers, offensive line, you know, whatever. Um, I think that Skyler coming back is a key piece that it should, it gives me confidence and it should give the fans confidence for what they, they'll see next year. I think in maybe three years from now, I think that, you know, one of Rubley or Howard might transfer away if it's, if it's pretty clear that, you know, one or the other is, you know, miles ahead of the other in terms of their, you know, play at quarterback. But right now I don't, I don't think that Skyler's decision has really much of an impact at all on it. Next question from Contra Cat with the addition of one transfer portal player as of December 22nd, how fast will others transmogrify? Did I get that right? I have no clue. I've never seen that word. I had to it's Google it while you guys were talking. Transmogrify. Uh, yeah. Into purple. So I guess, you know, how fast will others transmogrify into purple? Any thoughts on how many they would bring in for a total? I think, has Wally been teasing somebody soon? Yeah. So uh, there's at least one more on the way. And I wouldn't expect that to change. Or I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't expect that to be it at this point. Yeah. I guess I think I, I think they're, you're still going to see a steady amount of guys, and you know some of these guys. I don't think they're going to be flashy guys. I mean, really, you know, outside of maybe James Gilbert, this coaching staff hasn't 
gotten flashy guys. Brian just, Moore. Excuse me. Briley Moore was a flashy guy. Briley Moore, James Gilbert. Those were your two top guys, I guess, you know, as far as transfers, everybody else is just kind of a, you know, a, a role player, so to speak, somebody that, you know, they get them, you know, they're kind of a, a bandaid type piece to the, to the offense or defense. So, you know, I think, I don't know if Munoz is going to be a star, but you know, at, at linebacker, you know, losing Sullivan and Hughes, you know, maybe he steps up and he, he gets some playing time, but you know, I, I wouldn't, I would still expect, you know, a number of transfers for K state to pick up, especially as these seniors continue to, to make their decisions on whether they come back or not. Next question is from third gen wildcat. You've mentioned different times of locker room issues. Can you expound on what was happening? Are these issues we should be concerned will carry over into the future or that issues will be commonplace with this staff? Well, I, I don't know what the exact issues were. I mean, but there was apparently tension in that locker room. Maybe it was rooted in the Black Lives Matter stuff. I mean, that's been alluded to. I think that played a role. If you look at the guys who transferred, a lot of them were heavily involved in that. But, um, and, and like I've said, I, uh, I don't care what the topic is. If guys don't move on from that topic and want to continue to talk about it instead of focus on football, I would be annoyed. You know, if, if every time we had a, a staff meeting or, excuse me, a players meeting or a position meeting and I interrupted to talk about my love of Whataburger, you'd get pretty pissed off after a while. In fact, you get pissed off when I talk about my love of Whataburger on this podcast too often. I mean, I don't care what the topic is. If you can't return your focus to the task at hand, which is playing football at Kansas State, you're going to have teammates get upset with you. So I'm not sure exactly what it is. But I think we can tell that this was not a fully unified team. And by the transfers, there were some guys that were interested in other things. Um, and if you get a disruptor into your family, it's going to cause problems. We've seen it in basketball. And I think Jonathan Alexander, and I know some case staters are going to like, Fitz is talking bad about Jonathan Alexander. He was a bad dude in the locker room. I don't think his teammates liked him. And, and he's kind of had this influence over a lot of guys and led them down a bad path. Again, most of the guys in the transfer portal will never sniff Power 5 football again, and most of them won't sniff FBS football again. It's just the way it works, especially now. There are going to be limited opportunities going forward because of scholarships. There's going to be a choke on scholarships pretty quickly. Being in the transfer portal means you better have a plan because if your plan is just to find something else, you may not find it. So I know a lot of people are going to be upset that I, I talk about players like that. Look, I know you want to root for the players in purple, but I got news for some of you. Some of them aren't good kids. They just aren't. I mean, you acted like w when we were calling out the stuff Cartier Jada did last year as being destructive, that we were somehow attacking the kid or reporting that Malik Knowles was t telling everyone he wanted to transfer, that we were attacking the kid. These things are disruptions. They're worth noting. They're worth talking about. W you problems in the locker room, when one of your players is going around telling all his teammates he's going to leave, that's a problem in the locker room. So, uh, look, I, you know, I, I think some people still think Cardi Jada is God's gift or whatever, but he quit on his new team this year. He wasn't getting enough playing time, so he opted out. I mean, there's just sometimes these things happen. Sometimes you get a rotten apple and they get a hold and other ones kind of get the fungus too. And it's, it's been a problem. Uh, I think they took some chances on kids in that early recruiting class that now they're not doing. I'll say this. Gills, you talked to some of those recruits in this recruiting class. They're impressive. They're really good guys. I think this is a great group of kids. And you look across the aisle to Bruce Weber's team, every one of the new players we've spoken with 
really are fine representatives of the school. They seem to have their you-know-what together. So I think the coaches are kind of realizing at Kansas State, you better be real careful about what you pick because it can it can separate you out real quick. And at Texas, if this happens, you know what? They still win games because they're good enough. I mean, they've got enough talent, but they only win eight games or nine games or whatever it is that is dissatisfying. But at K-State, you got to be all rowing. you got to be all working in the same direction to get it done. And when it doesn't, it kind of falls apart. So do I know specifically what it is? No, but it might be as simple as some of these players didn't like each other. And that's going to happen in any group dynamic. Well done, Fitz. Well done. Next question from Powercat Ryan. How many of the 2021 class will be arriving early, and what does that really mean in this COVID climate? Well, I kind of have an opposite take of it. I I know it's weird that they're going to arrive early, but why would you want to be in high school right now? You know what I mean? Uh, It just seems weird if you're doing remote learning in high school or you're masked up walking through the high hallways and, you know, prom's probably canceled. And uh, I just, I, I think it would suck to be a high school senior this year. Just absolutely a dreadful experience. Just ruining a big, important part of your life. Not that there's a grand scheme or anything. It's just unfortunate. It's just a really bad thing. So why not just go to school, go to college, get your feet on the college campus, kind of acclimate yourself, have some practices, lift some weights, get ready to play. Just change the whole storyline of your senior year of high school. I think it's good. It's really, really a good thing now. You know, Bill Snyder kind of resisted it, finally went along with it. Chris Kleiman's all in. He wants them all here if they can get here. Get here, get that free spring. Because you get X number of springs with your eligibility. But you don't think about this. You're still in your senior season. For example, who do we want to pick right here? Uh, Drew Wiley. Uh, He's still technically in his senior year of eligibility, if you stop and think about it. I mean, if they played a bowl game in February hypothetically, he would be eligible to play that bowl game. Um, So that last spring is wasted eligibility. So you front load it by coming early and you get that spring. Um, So if you can come early, go spring, red shirt, get another spring, and then you're a red shirt freshman with two springs, big, big advantage. Yeah, exactly. I mean, take Jake Rooley, for example, who wasn't allowed to play the rest of the season. I think he got maybe a couple games in up in Iowa, and then they said, nah, you're ineligible. Um, So, you know, a guy like him, I mean, he was going to come early anyway, but, you know, for somebody that hasn't really played much football in the last 365 days, yeah, um, you know, a guy like him would want to, you know, get those reps, start training again and getting football ready. And kind of like what you mentioned, Fitz, yeah, you, you probably don't want to be in high school right now. It just, it sucks. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. And, and really, the college experience isn't what the college experience is going to be. So, and, and I feel like these, these incoming freshmen, if they come at the break and come in January, I feel like it's almost an advantage. They can focus mostly on football. You know, if they're going to be doing a bunch of online classes, um, you know, if they're not having to go into, you know, go on to campus and then just kind of, you know, stay in their dorm, just kind of stay focused that way. It, it might be better for them from a training aspect and getting better. So it, it could be an advantage. I mean, obviously maybe not across the the country based on, you know, everybody can come early if they want to, or, you know, however many the, the limit is, whatever it is. Um, You know, it gives an advantage to, hey, we can get football ready a lot earlier than what, you know, what it would be if we just stuck out one more semester in high school, you know, go to prom, you know, play baseball, whatever your, your spring sport is, basketball for winter sport, you know, just get here early and, and especially in this COVID climate, just, you know, do your online classes and work as hard as you can when you can get into the, to the football facility. Yeah. High school would suck right now for me because I'm 56. It'd be weird. <laughs> It'd be so weird. Still probably would struggle in some classes. Next question from Powercat Ryan. Any updates on spring football? Where the, Will there be more time given to teams this year? No. No, there won't. Um, I think that's weird. 
I, if you read my 12 steps to improving college football, I think this rule that they had where anyone can play an extra game this year, did anyone take advantage of that? I don't remember hearing that. Did anyone say, yeah, we didn't, we're not going to a bowl, but we're going to go play this school? And I never, I haven't heard it. I don't think so. I think, I think that's a rule they need to extend. I mean, why should you have to benefit from the arbitrary act of being invited to a bowl? I mean, if you're in the Big 12 and you're bowl eligible, you're going to go to a bowl, but you're not, that's not true if you're in the Sun Belt or Conference USA. You can be seven and five and left out of the bowl picture pretty easily. So you don't get the practices? Well, how's that fair? There's a six and six Big 12 team in a bowl, but you're seven and five and you didn't get a bowl bid, so you don't get the practice. So I think they should extend that and, you know, let anyone continue practicing, prepare for another game, however you want to do it. Um, but no, you're not getting back anything from the spring that you lost, which I think is weird and unfortunate. They have addressed a lot of issues. That wasn't one of them. And uh, we'll, we'll see. I mean, K-State wanted to go to a bowl just for that reason. I think the players didn't really want to. They might have voted yes. Yeah, you know, you don't want to say, Coach, I don't want to play because that's going to linger on your resume in the coach's head. But I think the team voted by getting COVID. I don't know how else to explain that. They just kind of got let their guard down and, and the cases rose. So, yeah, it's South Carolina. Apparently the coaches voted by getting COVID. I mean, I guess they ran a practice where Mike Bobo, the Interim head coach was the only healthy coach. That'd be it. That'd be a job running a full college practice by yourself. So I just think some people have said enough. And once you let your guard down in this environment, uh, that that opens the door to enough infections to stop it from stop you from playing. And and I'm getting really annoyed with people saying, well, what would the cases be if they hadn't played football or basketball? They would be so much better off. No, they wouldn't have. No, that, no. I mean, we don't really see evidence that playing the sports has caused increasing cases. I think it's actually made kids more diligent not to get it. I think it's totally screwed up thinking to somehow think that competition has caused the spread because I don't think that's rooted in reality. And to build on that, if they were just sitting at home, COVID cases across the country, you know, and across college campuses have risen you know, throughout the school year. So I, I think your point stands fits. Yeah. These, you know, having these daily, you know, not daily, but, you know, getting tested three times a week, you know, social distancing, being diligent. So, you know, you can actually play the games. Yeah. I think that they took this a lot more seriously than they otherwise would have had there been no football. Last question of the podcast from Anderson Blumont. How big would it be if Drew Wiley and Elijah Sullivan decided to return. Well, Elijah announced today he's not, and I don't think Drew is either. Um, I, I think your hopes now are Noah Johnson. Um, who AJ I, Parker. AJ Parker. I think he announced I, he's going. I didn't see anything from AJ Parker. Yeah, I think AJ Parker's announced oh. he's not coming back. Um, well, I need to update the thread if that's the case. But uh, Yeah, double-check that. But uh, I, I feel like I'm really leaving someone out, though. Um I thought there might be two more guys, and I'm only thinking of of Noah. Blake Lynch, Blake Lynch would be a good one. Yeah, that wouldn't suck. I think. He, could, he probably can't get into bars still. They probably <laughs> think he's always using a fake ID. <laughs> um, yeah, who am I forgetting? But anyhow, uh, it would have been huge. But, I mean, Elijah has NFL dreams. I don't know if – you know, that's part of the reason why they played him at safety because he's going to be a safety. I just think he's a tweener. He's never going to really catch on there. Um, but I mean, the guys that are, we know are coming back now, we're up to three with Thompson, Massey and, and McPherson. Those are big, big pickups. Yeah. So, um, anyone on top of that, I think Noah Johnson would be a nice pickup and whoever I'm forgetting. I, I, Cody Fletcher. Cody Fletcher. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, looking at the rest of the list, I mean, that's about it. You got Tyler Burns, Wesley Burris, Chris Dugan, Justin Eichmann, Justin. Noah Johnson, Blake Lynch, AJ <laughs> Parker, DJ Rinder, Keandre Thomas, and Drew Wiley are the yet to announce. I would take Keandre. Um, I, Cody Fletcher would be huge because of linebacker issues. So yeah, yeah, uh, it's it's an interesting rule. 
I get the feeling though, and and I and I don't have anything to go on here. I'm just talking. Uh, that K State is trying to stay at 85. That we talked about the budget issues early on. I mean, if you go to 90, you get five guys coming back, and you go to 90 scholarships. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money to fund another scholarship and training table and everything that goes into it. So I just kind of get the feeling they're trying to stay at 85. So if you get five guys back, you can keep it at 80. Um, and I think they are going to take some more guys out of the portal, which also keeps this class a little bit smaller. But I'm really happy with the class. We'll see if more come back. I thought we were going one a day. We had an announcement Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And as we tape this now on Wednesday, no announcement. Maybe there will be one. I don't know. I thought they had kind of gotten together and planned it all out. It was feeling that way. Well, I'll be back. Maybe, maybe we'll get a Christmas announcement from Drew Wiley. Well, that would be and a it'll gift. It'll be a, a, a gift. Or A.J. Parker. Maybe. I haven't seen anything. I don't. I haven't seen anything from AJ Parker that's that's definitive. Maybe. That isn't a that isn't reading into a retweet. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll get it via TikTok. And now that I'm a member of the TikTok China community, I will get it on my TikToker. Is that how it goes? TikTok. <laughs> what? I don't even know. I don't even know how the. I don't know. You, you tried your best. I did. That's pretty much how I live my life. That's it for the Power Cat Questions podcast. Everyone have a great Christmas. We'll be back leading up to New Year's. Basketball will be back. We'll have more stuff to talk about, more stuff to write about. Oh, man, we're running out of stuff. We're just we're just out of stuff. I am think I'm going to write a feature on my dogs. That'll be good. People like that. Power Cat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street Publishing. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked, temperature set, lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details.